All right, Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to pick it up where we left off last week in verse 8. And, you know, as, as we're studying through Isaiah, we have seen some distinct similarities between the time of Isaiah, right, ministering here to the nation of Israel and to, to our times. And it's been interesting to, to see those correlations. And, and throughout a chapter, well, really a book, that would cause a lot of a, a heartburn, right, for a lot of folks, because Isaiah is prophesying, which means speaking forth the truth of, of God's word, prophesying about a time of judgment, a time of, of correction. We talk about little j, judgment, right? So when God is working mightily in, in a nation, Israel, that has rejected his ways, right? And so we've seen a lot of similarities. So I, I decided today, uh, and, and I hope it's not too corny, but I took a little from the headlines, Right? And, and, a, and a reality that I think that, that we'll see for a message titled, Balloons and Nations Will Fall, <laughs> but God's Kingdom Always Remains. Amen? Amen. God's Kingdom Always Remains. And I, I was going to play a little bit more, and I, here I am, I guess I am playing a little more on the whole thing about hot airs and balloons and a lot of hot air being blown around, but I probably shouldn't go down that road. But, but anyways, balloons and nations will fall, and that's just the reality of life, right? And you, you look at history, but God's kingdom always remains, and that's a theme that we see through the, the book of Isaiah as he points us radically to the reign of Jesus Christ upon the earth that as believers we'll be a part of one day, right? We all have the great blessing as followers of Christ of, of being a part of the kingdom of God today. Right? As we wrapped up last week, we saw the strong encouragement through Isaiah's message to the nation to follow God's word. It's one reason if you're, you, you've been coming, you know, that's the focus of our, of our church service is God's word. Right? It's, it's what we need for nourishment for, for our soul, for our very lives. Right? It's, it's God's word and how God speaks to us through his word, and then as we see through Isaiah, the promise of the Son of God, our Savior, coming back, right? We, from this perspective, from Isaiah's perspective, Jesus, of course, the Messiah, was yet to come. Now he's come to pay the price for our sins. He came in humility. He came as, as uh, the, the Son of Man, the, the servant, right? Demonstrated that, that servant leadership, that uh, love, right? Sacrificial agape love, right? Which is an other-centered love, the love of God, demonstrated in, in, in human form, died and, and has risen from the dead. So he, he lives, he's among us by his spirit today. But one, one day soon, he will come again, right? He'll, he'll come with, in, in the clouds and with great glory. Uh, Pastor, my, my pastor, Pastor Bob, was saying that one time and someone came up and said, did you say Greg Laurie? <laughs> well, he'll be there too, right? But no, great glory, right? He'll be coming with, in, with clouds and great glory. And we saw, now you get it, right? Great glory. Um, Harvest Crusades. Um, so uh, he'll be there. <laughs> and the, the government that we saw last week will be upon his shoulders. And as we, as we see struggles in, in, in government, nations rising, nations falling, isn't it good to know that although from a physical perspective we are part of, of, of a nation together, that ultimately we belong to the kingdom of God. Amen. And the kingdom of God is wherever God's rule is. So as followers of Christ, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within us and the kingdom of God is around us. So I love that. And although we, we work hard and, and we do what we can to be good citizens, you know, of our nation, more importantly, we're first uh, allied with our King and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that hope throughout uh, Isaiah. So let's pick it up in, in uh, chapter 9, verse 8, where we read, The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and, against, uh, uh, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, so speaking of Remember we mentioned last week Ephraim is a reference to the northern kingdom, right? Uh, uh, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, 
The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on. Remember last week we read about the Lord really whistling for the foreign nations to come to bring judgment against correction against the nation of Israel. And it's because of their sin, because of their rebellion against him. The Syrians, verse 12, before and the Philistines behind. So just these enemies of the Lord, or enemies of well, the Lord, but of the nation of Israel coming against the nation. And they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And so because of, what he's saying here is because of their rebellion against him. Right? It's not that God initiated this judgment. Right? We do see God initiate in the scriptures, don't we? John chapter 3, verse 16. God initiates. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever would believe in him, place their trust in him, their hope in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God initiating. That's God's heart, is reconciling man to God. But when man continuously rejects God, he effectively just gives them over to the direction they've chosen. That's what we're seeing here, right? Is, is the nation has rebelled against the Lord, utterly turned their back on the Lord. And so God is, is allowing judgment. We'll see in the next section here that, that really for difficulty to come, all God has to do is lift his hand of protection, right? And, and we, we've seen that in our own country. And what he's talking about here. Where we read in, in their arrogance, verse 9, right? And they, and they say in their arrogant pride of heart, the bricks have fallen, et cetera, et cetera, we'll rebuild. They'll say, let, it, it's, what he's talking about here is the people saying, it doesn't matter, let God bring it, we'll just rebuild. If that's not arrogance, if that's not haughtiness, if that's not just plain dumb, right, for lack of a better word, I don't know what is. Turning their back on the Lord and refusing in spite of God reaching out, as he does with us at first, oh, so gently. Maybe, maybe a word, always through his word, right? Maybe through a message, maybe through our quiet time in the word, maybe speaking to our heart, maybe through circumstances. And, and it tends to sort of increase, right? You know, sort of that pressure, if you will. God saying, turn back to me. And that's what he's been doing here, and the nation continues to reject Right, So uh, because of their unholy pride, uh, Israel will be defeated by the enemies that God is talking about here. One commentator said, what, what a brief but deeply psychological picture this is of an unfaithful generation that keeps dreaming of better times to come and lightheartedly ex ignores the judgments of God. If that doesn't describe delusion... <laughs> I don't know what does, right? And if that doesn't describe some of what happens in our culture today, I don't know what does. You see God's loving hand reaching out. You can't help but see his blessing upon our nation like it was upon the nation of Israel, right? You can't help but see God wooing a nation back. And then as he does, increasingly, even with difficult circumstances, wooing the nation back, right? Calling the nation back. And yet, continuing to rebel. And, and, and as, as he says here, how, how foolish is that? Verse 13 says, For the people do not turn to him who strikes them. You know, like you might spank a child, right? You, you need to bring them back, right? The, you know, if, if your child is, you know, throwing food at the dinner table and, and you slap their hand, you don't slap their hand the next night if they don't throw food, right? They've learned their lesson. They stopped, and it could be a peaceful dinner or whatever the situation is, you know? And someone has trouble with the law in our country, and they go and they do their time, and they, they're done with that, and they come out, and if they don't do it again, great, right? Like, you learn your lesson. That's the idea. They won't learn their lesson, right? God continuously <clears throat> cries out, just like with America, continually cries out to come back to me, Right? But, but they don't turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, right, not God initiating, God responding, right, because of their sin, therefore the Lord will cut off the head and, ta uh, and tail from Israel. Palm branch 
and bulrush in one day. The elder and honorable, uh, he is the head, the prophet who teaches lies and false teachers, right? He is the tail for the leaders of his people. Cause them to err, and those who are led uh, by them are destroyed. It's a sad reality, but when you have uh, leadership that rejects God, leadership that makes poor decisions, it, it affects everybody, right? And that's, that's just a reality of, uh, of, of life. You know, we've been blessed for, you know, a couple hundred years in our nation, right? What, by God's hand of protection, and, and a nation that by and large had, was established on God's word and, and obedience to the Lord, and that's changed. And so we're seeing the unfortunate circumstances of that, just like the nation of Israel, right? Verse 17, therefore, right, because the leaders cause the people to err, uh, those who are led by them are destroyed. Verse 17, therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly, right? For all, for all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest, they shall mount up like rising sun. So notice, it's, it's the wickedness, it's the sin, right, that burns as the fire. Right? Like so often, we want to, we as, as, as humanity, right, hopefully not you and I, right, but we as humanity can tend to want to blame God for our problems, or want to blame God, or, or blame somebody else for our difficulties, rather than, than our own selves. But, but he says here that wickedness burns as a fire, right? The, the result of sin, very often, can, can be a, a consequence in and of itself. You know, I mean, I've given a, a, an obvious example, if I choose to, you know, go out and these days, probably if I had two beers, I would be on my back. But like, if I chose to go out and, and, and drink and get drunk and drive and I run into a tree, do I blame the tree? <laughs> do I blame the city that planted the tree? No, it's, it's my choice. And that's, that leads to a very difficult time, right? From a financial perspective, right? For paying for the car and any medical bills from a legal perspective because I was driving intoxicated. It brings a lot of difficulty but I have no one to blame but myself, right? The consequence of the sin is, is difficult in and of itself. God didn't have to do anything, right? That's just how it is. And so he, that's what he's talking about here, right? The wickedness burns as the fire. Verse 19, through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, and he shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. And every man shall eat flesh of his own armor. It's going to get really bad, he's talking about. Right? And, and uh, verse 21, Manasseh shall devour Ephraim, and Ephraim and Manasseh, their brothers. Right? Together they shall be against Judah, right? another tribe, the southern kingdom. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And I love that picture. You know, his, his hand is stretched out still, right? I've, I've come to believe that I think, you know, clearly we risk as we choose sin, whether it's as a nation or as an individual, we risk our heart getting hard, right? The author of Hebrews tells us, you know, do, uh, do not let your heart get hard, you know, when God is speaking to you, you know. Um, but regardless of how far an individual has gone, or, or a nation, I say that if, if you have breath, it's not too late. But, but it is contingent upon a, a, a genuine repentance and a turning uh, uh, in, in, with a genuine heart to the Lord. So in other words, uh, you, you, there is a risk of going too far in this life and not being able to turn back. But I, personally, I don't think it's on God's side. I, I think it's on the individual that they just made a decision to go too far. Different people think differently about that. But my exhortation is just get right with the Lord now, <laughs> right? If you care, you know, if, if our nation cares or people care, just get right with the Lord. Because if there is a genuine heart, it doesn't matter how far somebody's gone. God is, is not, you know, going to say, no, you can't. Does that make sense? Right? And so, so our, our, our principle here 
is that is number one from from this section God cannot be blamed for the difficulty of a nation or of a person that has turned away from God and rejected his help. God can't be blamed for the difficulty. Some people say, well, why is God letting this happen? Why are our schools going nuts? Well, we've taken God out of the schools by and large. I'm so grateful for the the believing teachers and administrators and others who work in the schools to, to minister to the kids. You know, I think about just a couple years ago, a great man of God who, who uh, ministered to the Valley football team and a uh, personal friend of mine and a uh, great heart. And, and so he's on, when the kids come off the field cussing out their coach, he's there saying, don't do, don't do that, right? Your coach is doing the best they can and, you know, change your attitude. He's loving on them. He's teaching them good character results. They're meeting at, at Valley church right adjacent to the to the high school uh, field three quarters of the football team voluntarily showed up wasn't required voluntarily showed up for a devotion before Friday night games and so it's it's a, a cool move of the Lord through this man's life and one parent one parent gets a little bit right and and that whole ministry is is shut down the part of it where a kid, where he could be on the sidelines right and and, and mind-boggling Right, then a lot of people spoke up. You know, we got involved, tried to try to change that. Obviously, they can't stop the devotion at Valley Church, you know, which was going on, thankfully. But but how how sad that you know here here God is is working, and so and again they always talk about the separation of church and state, right? Which isn't written in a letter, not not in the Constitution. It's nowhere in the Constitution. Any schools, a, a, a concerted effort by secular people to pull God out of schools. And you could put that in, I'm so thankful for believers in government, right, who are working hard and, uh, you know, I mean, you can't deny what God has been doing in the middle of the NFL recently. I talk about sort of a Christ-rejecting organization as a whole, uh, but when someone literally, their heart stops on the field, and all of a sudden, what was it, an ESPN reporter praying on national TV, you know, Radical. You think of Brock Purdy. You know, last week I did the you know Purdy Niners thing. You know, we got to take the good and the bad. <laughs> you know, not the way I wanted it to turn out, but uh, I, I wore the shirt this week to the gym. <laughs> you know, and so still a big fan. Yeah, of course, right? And but look at that young man's life, Mister Irrelevant to a rock star. Actually, better than a rock star. I don't know if rock star is always a good example to say, but. but but God working, it's so radical. But when, when we take God out of schools, when we take God out of government, we take God out of really thinking, people can't blame God for problems. It doesn't make any sense, but yet, yet many still do. So God cannot be blamed for the difficulty of a nation or, or, or a person when that nation or person, person has turned away from God and rejected his help. So we'll continue on now into chapter 10. And we're going to see... Uh, God using, in, in this case, it's going to be uh, God using the nations, right, uh, against Israel, and then they go too far, and so those nations are going to be judged. And, but they're an instrument of God, right, bringing that judgment, the correction against them. And it, But it brings a, a good analogy for us, right, as instruments of God, that we should remember that, that the work and glory belongs to God. There's not a person in this room or a person listening online who God does not want to use or who God cannot use. God has equipped everybody. I believe that God has uh, given all people some uh, unique gifts, right? Some people use it all for themselves. We, we do our best to use it for the glory of God, right? But as inter- in- instruments of God, we should remember that the work and glory is His, so with your life, with my life, with our lives, let people see his loving and honorable character lived out through you and just watch what he will do. Right? We'll, we'll see kind of an example of what not to do here in, in this passage. But I like to apply it to what, what we can do. Right? Let God uh, work through us, but as instruments of God, remember that the work and the glory is his. So pick it up in verse 10. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed. So, ungodly laws, ungodly practices, right? 
Woe to those, he says, to rob the needy of justice. How often do we see that? Right? A, 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 you hear about a two-tier justice system effectively. Right? And, I mean, you, you see blatant examples. <laughs> I won't go into it, but blatant examples in government today, right, where, uh, of, of the, the, the needy are robbed of justice and other people doing uh, uh, criminal things just flat out getting away with it because of, of where they are in government or society or whatever. To take what is right from the poor of my people, the widows may be their prey that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory? So it's, it's, it's good for us, those of us who want to see justice and right, rightness, righteousness happen, right? God doesn't, uh, none of this goes beyond the Lord, right? None of this goes beyond his notice, and there will be justice someday. Verse 4, without me they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Woe to Assyria, verse 5, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. So now he's, he's uh, crying woe against the nations that he had um, allowed to come down to bring judgment to Israel. And we'll see why. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the, the, the people of my wrath that will give him a charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So in other words, God was using them to as an instrument of of judgment, of correction to the nation of Israel to try to bring the nation back to him. But they went too far. Verse 7, yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations, for he says, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Cano like Carchemish, and is not Hamath like Arpad, and Samaria like Damascus, as my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, all I have done to Samaria and her idols shall I not also do to Jerusalem and her idols. So, so they're, they're saying that the, the nation has had, uh, had such success against the, you know, they would, in, in this time, they would uh, think if they want to battle against the city that their God defeated the city's God. And so what they're saying is that we have had such success against all these other gods, these other cities, Jerusalem, what makes you think we're not going to have success over you because these cities were stronger than you right and so uh they're they're getting puffed up rather than just keeping in their lane um verse 12 says therefore it shall come to pass when the lord has performed all his work on mount zion and on jerusalem so when god has accomplished the the correction that he desired i will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of assyria and the glory of his haughty look so it'd be Similar to, I, I used an illustration of a parent with a child. If the parent just went way overboard. It's one thing to correct your child lovingly to bring them back. It's another thing to beat them or abuse them. Right, two different things. So here, Syria and the kingdoms that had come against uh, uh, Jerusalem, against Judah, had gone too far. And they thought that it was their own strength. So God just says, you're, you're going to pay a price for that. Um, Verse 13, for he says, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand uh, has found like a nest the riches of the people. As one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth, even with the peep. Shall the axe boast against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff should lift up, and as if it were not wood. I was watching, or I saw a video on, I think Facebook, a, a young man who was in high school ministry when I was in, in youth ministry many, many years ago, and he's a lumberjack now, so he's doing stuff that, uh, you know, he's in way better shape than I am. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, he's swinging an axe and all sorts of tools, and 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 what what, what God is saying here is like when. When someone cuts down a tree, do you worship the axe? Oh, this axe is so great. No, it's the person swinging the axe. You know, when you, you go into surgery and the doctor, and you, you come out of the surgery better, do you go, oh, look at that scalpel. I'm so grateful. That, that scalpel is awesome. And you might be grateful for the scalpel, but more important, the, the person, the hand in which the scalpel was, 
right? The instru- the, that's just the instrument, right? And so when God uses us, we're just the instrument. God is doing the work. And so he says he's, he's rebuking them for getting puffed up thinking that in fact it was their own strength or their own ability that uh, brought this about. No, no. God is saying you took it too far. God should be the one getting the glory. Um, Therefore, the Lord of hosts will send leanness among his fat ones, and under uh, yeah, under his glory, he will kindle a burning like a burning burning of fire. And that that leanness, you know, I mean, a number of different applications, but it could be leanness of heart, right? Just not being satisfied. It could be, of course, you know, poverty. It could be uh, uh, themselves being demolished, right? But you know, God bringing this correction and this judgment against them. Verse seventeen. So the light of Israel will be for a, high, a fire, and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. And it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. So they were, at one point, these great uh, great nations, you know, they, they, they took it too far. And God is going to humble them as well. They got puff, puffed up. And exceeding their boundary. I can't help but think of Nebuchadnezzar, right? And well, look what I built. God humbled him seven years, right? Basically lost his mind. And then God restored his mind. Beautiful picture of God's grace. That's why I say it's nobody has gone too far. Jump with me over to uh, Psalm uh, verse or chapter 121. Whether whether things are really, really good. Or whether things are really, really hard. This is a good uh, section for, for us to consider. Because in, in Psalm uh, 121, pick it up in verse 1. I, well, I lift my eyes up to the hills from where comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Don't ever forget, that's where, that's where our hope is. Our help, our hope comes from the Lord. Verse 3, he will not... Allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God's always watching out for you. I don't know how he does it. I need my, you know, seven hours minimum. <laughs> you know what I mean? God doesn't slumber or sleep. He's God. He's always watching out for you. You know, the, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. God is for you. God loves you. And so as instruments of, of, of God, as instrument of, of his glory, just keep your eyes on him. It, it helps us to not lose hope and be discouraged in the difficult times. And it helps us to stay humble, right, and, and open and teachable uh, through, through, through the good times. So, so we, as, we, as we've seen so far, God can't be blamed for the difficulty of a nation or a person when that nation or person has turned away from God and rejected him. As instruments of God, number two, we should remember that, that, that the work and the glory, the credit, belongs to God. Right? So, so let it stay with God. Right? With our life, let, let people see his, his loving and his honorable character lived out through us. And, and then just watch what he'll do. Number three, as we pick it up, uh, in verse 20, we'll see that God is so patient with us. I'm, I'm grateful. I know about you. I'm so grateful <laughs> for, for God's patience in my life. Uh, he's so patient for with us. He will walk us through pain to refine us into the people that he has called us to be. And he will put us in the place he wants to be. Personally, so, you know, I wasn't a super great student. I mean, I wasn't like a too big of a troublemaker, but I wasn't a super great student. I wish I was, right? Um, but I now I would much rather learn through study or through someone else's experience than my own, right? But I, I have learned to be grateful that God will use pain when it's necessary. I, I wish, I would rather learn from a book, <laughs> Now I would rather learn from a book. I should have listened, but you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I, I would rather learn from a book than through pain. I would rather learn from a lesson than through pain. 
But God loves us enough to allow us to go through pain to refine us. Because keep in mind, we're going somewhere. This life is, is building us up for eternity in heaven. It's preparing us for eternity in heaven. I was reading this this week, a devotion, and it was talking about, uh, it caught my eye because uh, it was talking about Lewis and Clark, and my daughter likes to tease me when I say, okay, just turn west, and she's all, okay, Lewis and Clark, you know, is it right or left? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so so it caught my eye, you know, when, when uh, they talk about Lewis and Clark and how they, as they traveled, I mean, you think about, we get out a map, we don't get on map these days, right? We just open up our phone and type in the address. We don't even know if we're going west or east or north. Sometimes, right, we're just, you know, go continue straight, you know, whatever Siri or Google says, you know. And, and uh, but, but, but back then, they're journeying across this, this nation that uh, wasn't even a nation at the time, right, exploring. And, uh, I mean, I, 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 when they were going west, I remember uh, watching a documentary, because I do like, like that story. Uh, man, there was a part as they got to the Rockies where, they ended up, like, they went through shoes, which were basically, like, I think, deer skins or something like that, you know, pretty quick. And they, they, they traversed this really hard, and they're, and they're carrying everything between animals and pulling, and, you know, they hope to be on a canoe for a lot of the time. But anyways, they would have to stop to reorient. But one, one of the sections that they went through this really hard time on the way out, they basically floated. They, they were, like, 10 miles from, like, a river or something. That, but they didn't know, right? How would they know? And so... They had to stop and reorient, is the idea, uh, here uh, along the way. And the author said, unlike Lewis and Clark, who were going away from home, you know, on their journey west, we're not going away from home as believers, as followers. We're, we're heading home, right? Home is heaven at the end of the day. We're, we're you know, the, the scriptures talks about these bodies as our tents, Right, temporary dwelling places. We talks about our, our home being in heaven. We we are, are going towards heaven, and and so it changes everything as as we walk through pain. Right, as we see here uh, in this passage, as we've wrapped up uh, that that section, that um, God that that He's so patient that He'll walk us through pain if needed to refine us into the people. That he, has, that he has called us to be. And so, um, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the scripture says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. I love that. Exceedingly. And I could, I could ask or imagine a lot. I don't know about you, right? Man? He's not able to, to do just more. Exceedingly abundantly, whatever that means. That's a lot, right? He's able to do more than we can ask or imagine. I, I love that that truth, right? And so, so seek the Lord, trust the Lord, enjoy the Lord, um, and and know that God is is so patient with us. Um, now, now pick it up from verse twenty here. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, so remnant is a small. Those who were faithful, right? Even through this challenging time that the nation was in, God allowing other nations to come against them to bring judgment, correction, hopefully to get them back to their knees, like perhaps he's doing in America, right? To get us back to our knees, back to seeking him, right? That the remnant, those who are faithful, even through the times of crazy leaders, you know, through times of difficult times, times of, of immense stress, if you think about it, Right, the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. So important. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to, to the mighty God, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand and the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined and in the midst of all the land. I love that, right? God has you. God has me. God is with us. He is for us. Therefore, verse 24, says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. Right? So put in whatever you're afraid of, right? That would have been a conquering army. You know, America, 
you know, militarily isn't really afraid of, of anybody per se. I mean, there's, the, the, you know, I th hopefully, uh, you know, there's reason enough in, in most leaders to realize that nuclear war kills everybody, pretty much, right? And so, you know, America's not really afraid of anybody, but put in there whatever you might be afraid of. You know, I mean, um, and, and that, that's the idea here, right? He shall strike you with the rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt, for yet a very little time. And the indignation will cease, as will my anger and their destruction. So, so persevere, right? That's one of the that's one of the words I think for you know I, I like to seek the Lord. Well, I like to seek the Lord all the time, but like every year, sort of uniquely, like Lord, anything unique for this year, you know, persevere definitely uh, a good word. And the Lord of Hosts, verse twenty six, will stir up a, a, a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, and his rod was on the sea, so will he lift up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass. In that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. He has come to Aath and has passed Migron at Michmash. He has attended to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeath of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galem. Cause it to be heard as for Laesh, Elpore, and Anathal. Manama has fled. The inhabitants of Geban seek refuge. As yet he will remain at Nob that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord of behold the, the Lord, the Lord of hosts will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the hardy will be humbled. He will cast down the thickets, the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. I, I love the reality, right? That God is so patient with us that that He's always looking for those. For when will return as individuals and those who are willing to. That, that remnant here, I, we're part of it, I believe, in our country. right? And, and as I mentioned, it's so refreshing to know that the kingdom of God is around us. I like what David Gusick said. He said, the Lord promises his people, you are grow, going through this now because you will not trust me, but I am going to change you so that you trust me again and you will once again depend on on the Lord. So when we find ourselves in that place, know that God is at work in you. And I love the fact that he is, he cares that intimately for us, that he's willing to work in our lives as individuals. He's, he's working in us as a nation. And, and, and this, this just shows to me the remarkable grace and the patience of God as, as he continues to refine Right. Um, even in the midst of deserved judgment, right, because they had rejected his ways, he's gracious. I love that about the Lord. I love that about the Lord. And I think for time's sake, I'll just kind of give you a glimpse of chapter 11. But, but here's, here's, here's the overarching point, and we'll, we'll pick up in chapter 11 next week. As we travel through hard times, right, there, there's a lot of talk of, of that today. But, but in reality, if you look at history, there's been hard times before, right? I mean, in a way, the history of humanity is sort of a history of struggle, right? And we, we shouldn't think it's going to be any different. We, we have been, as a nation, uniquely blessed, right? Because of the grace of God, because of, uh, at, at one time, an overall general seeking of the Lord, certainly upon our founding and as, as time has gone on. But as we travel through hard times, it is important that we keep in mind that when we walk with God, it's not about where we are, but where we're going. Right, back to what I mentioned, we are headed towards home. We are traveling towards home, towards eternity with Jesus. And that, that is like Lewis and Clark had to pause, and they were using their instruments they had to sort of reorient to where they were to figure out where they're going to go. Sometimes we have to pause to reorient. Where am I going? And, and, and to have that, that perspective, right? Because the history of the world is, is a history of the rise and fall of nations. We shouldn't put our hope in it. I love America. I love what it stands for. I love what it was founded upon. It's, it's changed, right? But, but nations rise and fall. That's just the history of the world. 
that's why it's so important that we have our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, upon reality. I, I still pray and hope for revival in our nation. That is our only hope, right? I mean, otherwise it's one way or the other. It's two very, very different mindsets, right? And so, so revival is, is the only hope for, you know, kind of turning back to, to where, you know, people go, oh, you're, you're going backwards. Well, it's not backwards. It's actually going forwards, right? If, if we turn to the Lord, right? We're going backwards now. We, we need to turn to the Lord. But as we travel through hard times, it's important that we keep in mind that when we walk with God, it's not about where we are or where we've been even, but about where we're traveling to. And so as we close, I want to encourage us, right, turn to God in prayer. We know that, right? But I need to be reminded, we all need to be reminded. In the midst of the challenging things, turn to the Lord in prayer, as we just saw in Psalm 121. And then follow his leading in the circumstances of your life, right? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Where God's rule is present, that's the kingdom of God. And so that's, a, that's among us as followers of Jesus. And know that without question, no matter what is going on, no matter how great the highs are or how low the lows are, that God loves you and he is for you and he is with you and he is at work for good in your lives as we travel on this journey towards home. So keep your focus and your trust in him through the great days and through the stormy days. I know we were talking, I think yesterday, right? I mean, you know, the day before it's like, what, 10 or something? And then the next day it's like 50, you know? Regardless of the temperature, right? keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. We'll close together in prayer.